Hello everyone and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today I'm delighted to talk again to Iman Tom. Welcome back, sir. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on. Alhamdulillah. Well, as you know, um, Tom has kindly agreed to discuss the books that have made a significant difference to him intellectually. And today, Tom continues his reflections. This is actually, actually the fourth video on a fascinating book by Professor Talal Assad. This one here, entitled Formations of the Secular uh, Christianity, Islam and Modernity. Now, this is not a, this is not the most clickbaity of titles, but I promise you the content is very stimulating very interesting indeed so uh this as i say this is the fourth part the final part of uh the, the videos and uh in in this section we're gonna look at the third section of the book which is the final third of the book so over to you imam tom thank you very much bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu salam rasulillah so very excited today to inshallah bring this to a conclusion because mm -hmm. it's been a great uh, experience for me to review a, a book that i had read some time ago and that was very transformative for me and reading it again you know yeah. it's it's a dense enough and more and complicated enough text that you can keep on discovering things when you return back to it especially mm -hmm. if you have changed as a reader uh mm -hmm. over the in between the two readings. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity. We had said before that the book is organized into thirds, okay? So the first third of the book was about um, uh, the secular, right? This idea of uh, what are the things that a political program called secularism would want to try to advance? What are the preconditions, right, um, For that would pave the way for a sort of the, the political project that eventually became secularism. And so the second third of the book is about that kind of more political aspect to it, the political project uh, of secularism and, mm -hmm. you know, still at a theoretical level, but yeah. a little bit more boots on the ground. The final third is taking some historical examples, particularly in Egypt and yeah. talking about the unfolding of the process of secularization. Okay, mm -hmm. so the final third is about secularization, how it unfolds, taking historical cases and noting how basically the real history backs up what the author has kind of laid out theoretically, but also illustrating some new sort of dynamics and some things that are worthy of note. All mm -hmm. of this, of course, going back to pushing against the received or accepted thesis or understanding of secularism that secularism is simply a clean either a clean break from what came before it in that secularism is liberating right the modern world from a religious past especially a religiously dogmatic or religiously authoritative past right that's one historical interpretation of it so asset is saying it's neither that nor is it to say that secularism is a simple continuity from everything that came before. So if we had religious dogmatism or if we had religious authoritarianism, this is simply the new religion, right? The, the secular state or the nation state is simply the new religion. And he mm. discusses, and we talked about this before, about how there are, there are points of truth or there's a grain of truth in that sentiment and that observation, but it really poorly captures all of the different changes that occurred uh, from the shift from pre-modern governance to modern governance, from the, the shift to forms of governance that were that came before the nation state, the secular nation state, and those that came after. Uh, and so uh, he rejects both of those sorts of theses. And he's saying that secularism is a rearrangement of relationships, right? Re rearrangement of relationships between authority, uh, government, ethics, morality, law, and all of these things, they produce a new type of subject, a new type of human being. They produce a new sensibility about the world or several types of sen sensibilities. And we cover this when we talked about sensibilities towards pain, sensibilities towards agency, sensibility toward, towards freedom and all these sorts of things. And, and, and just to, so just to pause on that point, that the, the result is that we inhabit a world now which uh, is experienced very often as self-evident, as axiomatic. It's just part of the air we breathe, the water we swim in. It's not seen as historical 
historically particular, the product of a, a series of forces and evolutions that have happened throughout history, struggles and conflicts. And so it has this kind of self-evident natural quality for many people. I'm not saying many Muslims experience it like that, but so, so it, it doesn't really appear to be a kind of a type. It just is natural. And this naturalness for many people is is is, is the naivety of, of our age because it's not natural. It is recent, particular, localized, and the outcome of particular forces, which this book describes in detail. So I just want to get that point in. Yes, and that's also a, the basically the question that he uses to launch from in the, the, the final third of the book, uh, Secularization. So he poses this question, uh, how did Muslims think about secularism prior to modernity, okay? And he deals with a claim, uh, the claim that secularism was always central to the past and the Muslim past because supposedly, allegedly, uh, sh the Sharia always occupied a restricted space within the government of society. So just as before, there were some people who wanted to read secularism as a simple continuity from what came before, there are also people and thinkers in the Muslim world who try to mm. say, wait a second, secularism is nothing new. In fact, secularism is Islamic because the Sharia uh, occupies a different sort of space of governance or different spheres of activity than maybe uh, a sort of law from in a different part of the world in a different time. Okay, so Esed wants to problematize this claim um, as anachronistic, and to do that, he goes into some definitions and some uh, archaeological sort of uh, analysis of the terms. So he, he looks at what is it that we're trying to say when we say we speak about secularism and secularization. It would be an anachronism, right, to say that or to identify that secularism existed in a certain remote pre-modern past if there was no such thing as secularism in the first place or no sort of sensibility that was the same sensibility of what today we call secularism. And so he talks about what's the terms that we use to talk about secularism in Arabic? What are the history uh, or the histories of those terms? And what are the different sort of ideas that populate and constitute those terms? Are they really exactly the same thing that we're referring to when we talk about secularism in the modern age? And do they really apply to the pre-modern, pre-secular history of those spaces? So the first term that he talks about is al-mani, right? Al-mani is kind of the, um, the term that most people in the Arab speaking world use to describe secularism or something that a secularist he does a wonderful job looking at different dictionaries and classical dictionaries and modern dictionaries of Arabic, and he can only find the first usage of this term popping up in the late 19th century. Um, yeah. And what it refers to in those sort of entries is, quote, the transfer to worldly purposes of endowments and properties pertaining to worship and religion. And so Esed raises a red flag right here. He says, think of not only don't just let your attention be drawn to the fact that this is a very very new term and a new coinage right this is something that was a term that literally had to be invented because it described a new reality that nobody else had experienced before that's only part of the story the other part of the story is that the reality that the word was contrived to define was not a reality that existed within muslim spaces it was actually an imported experience from Europe, right? So again, the definition was the transfer to worldly purposes of endowments and properties pertaining to worship and religion. So Esad, he points out that in our tradition, in the Sharia law, we have the waqf, the plural of which is awqaf. And this definition of al-mani doesn't make any sense when tried to apply or attempted to apply it to the systems of waqf and awqaf in the sharia law because very very often awqaf were dedicated to worldly purposes in the first place right Great. so you see that there's a contradiction here or an opposition let's say that's set up in the definition of the word we're converting uh to worldly purposes religious yeah. properties, endowments, properties pertaining to worship and religion. And Esad is pointing out that that opposition doesn't exist within Sharia law. That yeah. the, 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 the typical and usual example was that the waqf was dedicated to worldly purposes, whether it was to pave the roads, whether it was to uh, for hospitals, for schools, for whatever, name it. There's a famous okay, story. Can you find that a, a, bit, a bit more uh, what we're talking about? So we're talking about a financial endowment here by presumably a wealthy individual yes. uh, to continue in perpetuity for charitable purposes or whatever. 
right and this is something that was uh, uh attacked or or, or uh, banned or outlawed or abolished by the colonialists i suppose um in due course but um it, it, that's what we're talking about is it this kind of endowment Yes, the Waqf is a technology, an economic technology, and a devotional technology within the Sharia, where somebody, um, they dedicate a certain underlying asset to mm -hmm. produce, the, the, the use of fruct of which can only be used for a certain purpose. Okay, so if the, the most common example is to take a piece of uh, real property such as land or a building and whatever sort of income that's produced off of that land or building, whether it's rent, whether it's crops or anything, then it's going to be applied to a certain cause, whether it's feeding the orphans or running a hospital or paving a road or anything like this. Now, this the interesting thing, and we'll talk about this inshallah when we go on to talk about Halak and his books, but the interesting thing is that this is the only type of inalienable, irrevocable property that exists in Sharia. Every mm -hmm. other type of property, you know, it has to be kind of dissolved upon death or it's inherited or it's given off or something like this, right? It's changing hands. But when it comes to the waqf, this is something that is considered to be owned by Allah, okay? And right. it is irrevocable, right? You can't take back the status of this sort of religious endowment once it has been consecrated as a religious endowment. And as you said, it is perpetual. It's, a, it's perpetual. It's perpetual. It's going to be applied until eternity. So that's what is responsible. And again, without getting ahead of ourselves, Halak draws more attention to this in his books. When the European colonizers came to the Muslim lands, they were often frustrated because they found that sometimes over half of the actual real estate was occupied and tied up in religious endowments, wow. right? And so uh, they saw that as one of, in addition to the law, which is what Esad is going to talk about, the law, legal reforms, in addition to the law being an obstacle and trying to reform the law, the other or perhaps the biggest threat or obstacle to, col to colonization that the Europeans found was the waqf system. And mm -hmm. so you had uh, this uh, extensive, massive uh, practice where land and, and property was tied up for these sorts of charitable purposes. It was responsible for so much of the decentralization and the independence of the ulama and the scholarly sort of tradition Again, we'll get to that later, but uh, this is this is what's going on. So right. Europeans had their own experience of sort of the the landed religious uh, religious lands, and uh, we talked about this before in England and in other places where these mm. sorts of properties were uh, they were confiscated by the government and then redistributed, yeah. put back on the market. Right, Henry VIII confiscated a whole bunch of monasteries and uh, church land for that purpose. In fact, the money ended up in his 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 mates' pockets mainly. Well, there it you didn't go. Have the people's uh, hands, particularly. Yeah. Exactly, and and sure, I'm sure he justified it for the public common oh, good and all these sorts of things. So that goes to show you another aspect. But um, but yeah, exactly. So the Europeans came with this sort of experience, okay, and they defined this term in you know relation to this type of experience, and then the coin gets term uh, the term gets coined in Arabic to describe a European experience with European oppositions and mm. European sensibilities that doesn't at all match what's really the reality on the ground when it comes to Muslim lands and the systems of waqf. So that's just dealing with this translation of al-mani. Then see, he goes to two other terms. He talks about secularism. Even though, How can we say that we see secularism or that secularism is part of a pre-modern Muslim past or a pre-modern Islamic past when this word itself has only been in usage since about the mid-19th century? Okay, so again, the one thing that we have is the newness of the term. And people don't just invent terms out of nowhere. They invent terms to describe new experiences and new realities, right? So the term secularism itself in the way that it's currently used, not talking about its Latin predecessors, but in the sense that it's currently used, and we'll define it in a second, only came about in the mid 19th century. And in that time, it became, it came to mean the doctrine that morality, national education, and even the state itself should not be based on religious principles. 
Okay, this is the textbook definition that most people understand and it's intuitive to them today. But this usage of the term secular or secularism to describe this experience was not precedented until about the middle of the 19th century. So how are we going to say that this sort of thing is a continuous presence within the, uh, we can find secularism in the pre-modern Islamic past or the pre-modern Muslim past when this term is very new, describing a very new type of arrangement and relationship between all these sorts of forces, education, morality, and the state. And finally, he talks about uh, laicisme, right? Uh, laicite, the word that is, and the concept that is used to describe the certain flavor of French uh, secularism. And this also comes about in the same time period as the term secularism, the mid 19th century. And the interesting difference between the definitions between the two, and this is very telling for anybody who has experience of the two different flavors of sort of secular rule, um, the doctrine that gives institutions a non-religious character. Okay, so that's a little bit more boldly stated than secularism, which is simply should not be based on religious principles, okay, where there's still room to sort of translate religious principles into uh, humanist humanistic terms. But within laicisme, it's the doctrine that actively, not passively, but actively gives institutions a non-religious character. So yeah, they it's might- It's kind of, kind of muscular um, secularism as opposed to the slightly more uh, laid back English or British uh, version, which is not quite so aggressive. Yes, yes. So all of this to say, this is all part of his answer that secularism did not exist in the Muslim world prior to European colonization. That secularism was an import and it was imposed from the outside. He says, yes, indeed, secularization was often the justification for colonization in the first place, that the Muslims had to secularize, they had to become civilized, and the way to do this was through secularization. So it begs the question, if secularism existed in the Muslim lands already at the time when European colonists arrived, then there would have been no need to colonize the Muslim lands in the first place, right? So. Colonization is all steeped in this sort of process of secularization. And the thing that I think uh, that Esed wants to zero in on in the final third of the book specifically has to do with legal reform. We mm -hmm. talked about breaking up the waqfs and redistributing sort of the land and putting it back on the market and all these sorts of things. That's something that we're gonna have to deal with in a separate book. But here, Esed wants specifically to focus on the legal reform. One of the primary, you could definitely argue that the, the, the civilization mission was very much a legalistic mission, okay? It had other dimensions as well. It had the brute violence, it had brute killings and, and abduction, and it had economic extraction and, and exploitation. Yes, all of these were different dimensions of the colonial project, but there was definitely a major thrust, if not the major thrust of the colonial project was legal reform. And you'll find that wherever the colonizers went, they were so fixated, obsessed even, with the idea of legal reform. They came to these places, whether it was Indonesia and the Malay archipelago, or whether it was to the Indian subcontinent or different parts of Africa and the Middle East. And they would look at the laws and they would look at the customs and they would say, what a mess. We need the rule of law. That's what they would say. And they would then undergo a project of trying to reconstruct uh, literally build a state, nation building, but not in, you know, usually that term is used to say something good. In this case, this was a power grab, right? This was a nation building built around a different sense of law entirely. So as it's going to look at two um, broad sort of phenomenons within this or phenomena within this historical reality, he's going to look at the simple plain fact that this is an importation from outside. Okay, so that's something that's well known. And he's going to give some sort of, you know, teeth to the historical account of that and also some interesting reflections. But that's not his main point. Everybody knows, although there's a few people that try to disagree, but he's going to address them, that the legal reforms that took place, the penal codes, all the sort of legal codes that came, they were outside. They were came from outside. They were imposed from foreign traditions. That's the well-known part of things. His main interest, though, that he gets to is the changes in the concept of law itself. Hmm. So Esed's big thing, and he thinks that this is more significant even than the fact that the particulars about the law, they came from outside, that the 
idea and concept of law itself was changed in this process of colonization that, es that ushered in secular modernity. The idea of what law is in secular modernity is different from the idea of what law is before secular modernity. And he's going to sort of look at a couple case studies or representative kind of locations where uh, that can be made evident. So first, he's going into the fact that this is all imported from outside, and he's going to look specifically at um, Egypt. Um, and he goes a little bit through the Tanzimat reforms that happened to the Ottoman Empire. He's setting the stage that all of this was happening from the middle to the late 19th century. So he talks about, for example, within the Ottoman Empire, and technically at the time, Egypt was under the rule of the Ottoman Empire, even though that was a very tenuous and sort of weak yeah. relationship of rule. The Ottoman Tanzimat reforms began in 1850 with the commercial code. They continued on. There was the penal code that was passed in 1858, the commercial procedure code in 1861. This is where, you know, for to place yourself within U.S. history for people who are U.S. history buffs, this is now Civil War era time. Okay, and then you have the Majella um, that is being made, the codification of the Sharia law that's happening between 1870 and 1877. In Egypt, as we said, which is at the time under nominal control of the Ottoman Empire, um, we have the introduction of the civil code of mixed courts in 1876, the formation of separate Sharia courts, and we'll talk about the curtailed jurisdiction of those Sharia courts starting in 1880, and then finally the M Napoleonic Code that took effect in 1883. So this was uh, uh, was not just economic exploitation. This was the reform of law. Um, and this was one of the principal concerns of the European colonizers and the colonizing forces, that they would come and change the law. And we'll see why uh, in a bit. Three main steps or stages in which this occurred, specifically in Egypt. Step one is that the Sharia courts were reduced and curtailed in their jurisdiction. So at the time when the European colonizers arrived, there were different types of courts. There were the Sharia courts that usually kind of uh, handled the jurisdiction over urban areas and specifically uh, Muslim subjects. And then there were rural courts that were pretty much dominated by Urf, that were dominated by or informed by uh, local custom and customary law. Mm. And then you had the, the millet sort of system of courts that was open to or supposed to have the jurisdiction over the non-Muslim various sort of uh, populations that were throughout the Ottoman Empire. And Esad points out that there's interesting scholarship that indicates that the actual um, ways in which subjects use these courts was very fluid. So it wasn't always that you were completely restricted to just go to one court based off your personal status. It was actually rather that people had a, a fair degree of freedom to kind of go to whichever court they thought was going to give them the most um, amenable outcome. And actually, there's evidence that many non-Muslim subjects regularly appealed to the Sharia courts for their rights because they found the Sharia outcomes much more favorable to them than their own sort of millet courts who were supposed to be of their same co-religionists. <clears throat> So that was the first The first stage was kind of the limiting of these Sharia courts. So the European colonizers, they stepped in and they said, okay, we're going to have these Sharia courts, but now we're going to limit the types of cases that they're going to hear. From now on, the Sharia courts are only going to deal with cases that have to do with family law, marriage, divorce, inheritance, these sorts of things, and issues that have to do with the waqf, with this religious endowment and things like that. Criminal law, commercial law, every other type of law is going to be handled now by secular courts. The second step within this sort of process was the bureaucratization of the Sharia courts themselves. Mm -hmm. So you even have, okay, you have a little bit of space carved out for you, even though there's much to say about that, where the Sharia courts are able to uh, still have some say in family law and in the, the religious endowments. However, now they have the state behind them and they are under the state. And so now there are different procedures that are introduced to the um, administration of justice within the Sharia courts. Documentation is standardized. You have centralization with the appointment of judges and, and even with the allotment of jurisdictions and things like that. So this is all the second stage is the process of bringing the Sharia under the control of the state. 
And this is something that is enormously significant because as Halak shows in some of his books, the individual Mufti had a lot of flexibility and a lot of, uh, in his ability to administer justice, right? And it was not um, his first, or the Qadi, his first recourse was not always to issue a, a verdict and, and then force people by the violence of the state or the violence of the government to, to adhere to that thing. The, the Qadi or the Mufti, their first role was to try to reconcile. They would try to appeal to different sort of traditions and customs. Oftentimes, the Muftis and the, and the Quda that were from a particular area, they were from that particular area. So you're talking about people who knew each other for decades and decades and decades. That was the situation um, upon which the European colonizers intruded upon, and they came with their centralization, and they came with their documentation, and they came with their uh, canonization. And now you've got the central state authority is going to assign a Qadi over here and assign a Mufti over here. And then you imagine that politics play a role in this because now who gets to be assigned and who doesn't get to be assigned. Now the salaries are controlled, not by waqfs, but by the central government. And so if a certain mufti or a certain qadi steps out of line, then the state has the authority to kind of play with that and cut somebody off and in order to control and manipulate this sort of outcome, right? And in 1955, finally, under, uh, under Nasser, we have the dual court structure was completely abolished and the complete kind of takeover of the secular courts. This is something that's uh, that's very significant when a lot of people in my videos and also in the videos we've done together, they talk about Islamic governance and an Islamic state, whether it's this state or that state or this government and that, that government, and they wonder about Islamic laws, right? And they talk about, well, the the it's almost as if the assumption is that we can have Islamic governance simply by writing laws from the Sharia. Yeah, right? Because this famously Halak's book, you know, the impossible state. You can't have a, you can't Islamize uh, the modern state. They're so fundamentally incompatible. Uh, but I'm, I'm very struck by uh, also in the 19. In the, in the 20th century, the ulama, the, the scholars of Al Azhar University in, in Cairo in Egypt, they uh, apparently they, they became civil servants. They became paid by the state. They became state yes. employees as well, so that they, they lost their independence. They were no longer issuing fatwa uh, 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 independently of government. They were part of the state itself, and well, one kind of had a feeling that that was a loss of, of the, the the integrity of the Sharia. It is ability to operate freely uh, without interference, and that that comes from an Islamic, uh, so-called Islamic uh, context, not just from a colonial one. Yeah, sorry, no, 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 that's fantastic, and we'll get to those sorts of issues about who's doing it, and is it just <laughs> simply uh, an issue yeah. of the outside foreign imposition, or is it also there's a lot of complicit agents on the inside, and of yeah, course, with, uh, with the absolutely. colonial situation, the answer is always yes. The answer is always yes. There are collaborators on the inside. That's what made it possible. Um, but we'll get there. But yeah, so the, the response to sort of the, I would say the, the surface level sort of um, engagement with the issue that, well, it's just about passing Islamic laws or Sharia derived laws. No, that's yeah. actually the problem in the first place, right? Yeah. That people want to know about, um, you know, Iran, what's going on in Iran and their sort of law about imposing uh, the hijab or something like that. This is exactly what we're talking about. This is the state. This is the power of the state. The Sharia is nowhere to be found. Right. This is the state that is trying to manipulate and impose certain sort of quote unquote Sharia divide uh, derived laws. Right. But in reality, at the end of the day, it's all about the modern state. And it is a secular state, by the way, even if there are some trappings and Sharia derived laws, which we'll get to. We'll get to some sort of interesting things. But that brings us to, again, um, the issue of what are the dynamics here? Okay, so we have two dynamics. One of them is European coercion, of course, right? That has to be stated. Uh, and everybody knows that and everybody should recognize that. But the other, the other sort of dynamic, and this is exactly what you brought us to, is the collaboration of the Egyptian elite. Okay, exactly. and this is a very, very significant um, vector within the whole thing, right? There were a population of Egyptian elites that were infatuated with European and Western ways, and they saw them as superior. And this was part of the goal of colonial education and trying to incentivize the elite from various parts, whether it's India and the subcontinent or the Middle East or wherever, to come to Oxford, to come to the different universities in the yeah. West and 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 become basically indoctrinated and and impressed with the Western ways and the Western system. 
I, I saw a report yesterday that 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 stated that full uh, half of all the world's non-Western leaders are actually educated and trained in the United States or in Britain. Actually, these oh, are Anglo-American, so they go to in Britain they go to Sandhurst and a whole, whole slew of African leaders have been educated and trained uh, here uh, and obviously in America too. Um, but half of them, apparently half the world's leaders have been trained in the States or in Britain, which yeah. says a remarkable amount about where, you know, the, their formation, their ideas are coming from. Yes, no, exactly. If you just run down the heads of state, you just go hop on a map like country to country and look at where the king or the prince or this person or that person was educated. Yeah. It's almost always the West. And that can't be simply because the universities are better, right? Mm -hmm. Or the, the, the quality of education is quote unquote better. Um, no, there's a reason behind this because culture is power and knowledge is power, not in the way that people oh, usually yeah. understand it. It's soft power, rather military power. Yes. This is soft power, which is can be uh, e equally powerful in its own way. Exactly, exactly. And so there were definitely a whole uh, cast of Egyptian elites that were infatuated with Western ways and uh, which were definitely um, sort of throwing themselves to into this project of reform, reforming the law and reforming the uh, even the Sharia itself. And so there's a nice quote here I've pulled from uh, from the book uh, Esed. He says that in 1882, immediately after the British occupation, Hussein Fakhri Pasha, the new minister of justice, wrote a memorandum arguing that a Sharia based code would not be consistent with the arrangements to which Egypt Egyptians were accustomed and urged that the laws then being applied in the mixed courts should be adopted by the national courts. The notion that such laws would be more suitable for Egyptians than anything that might be based on the Sharia represents an aspiration for a westernized future rather than for a reformed continuity of the recent past. Well, what right, so what page is that in the book? 215. That's page 215. Okay, thank you. Right. So here's the here's the game that was being played with these sorts of reformers is that to the people they were giving lip service to this reform of Islam and renewal of Islam and I mean we even experience these things today when we hear how sort of people talk about you know the maqas of the sharia and the renewal of the tradition and sorts of things like that but then when they go to their conferences and their sort of you know gatherings with European elites sort of the mask comes off and you see that really it's a thin veneer for um, the, the sense of Western superiority that they have internalized in the footnote there on that page footnote 26 um, the, the author, he says that Fakhri's implicit reference is to the previous Minister of Justice, Muhammad Qadri Pasha, who had attempted to codify the Sharia. Um, and then skipping down, he said, in effect, Fakhri's argument in the memorandum is that legal changes in Egypt have gone too far to talk of returning to a formed Sharia. And anyway, the European codes are superior. Mm. So this is the belief of these cultural elite within these these places. Um, so Esad he reckons with this. So there's this the, there's this contingent of people who are reformers, who are claiming that their reforms are going to be based on Islamic law, based on Sharia. This is the language that they use to legitimize their project. And Esad astutely points out is like okay, well, if it was truly based on Islamic law, and Islamic law or the Sharia is what you had before, then what really is the need for change in the first place? There's again, the sort of circular reasoning, just as if secularism was present in the pre-modern past, then why would there be a need to colonize and civilize the Muslims in the first place? Well, if these new legal reforms are based on the Sharia and the Sharia is what we had before, then what's the point in bringing something new if the Sharia is so important to inform the new law? And so then he goes in to talk about, okay, well, there's a group of historians that's very uncomfortable with laying blame at the feet of this cultural elite within Egypt and other places that have been colonized. And there's a tendency to read onto their legal reforms that they themselves initiate and participate in to read that as a form of resistance. We know mm -hmm. that the sort of left inspired history, they love to read everything in terms of resistance. And the idea here is that if we are just going to, or I should say the shubha, not just the idea, is that if we're going to say that it's just an imposition from outside, then we are denying agency and denying humanity to the oppressed uh, colonized, that they are not simply objects, they're not simply victims, they're not simply all this sort of thing. And we're actually 
disempowering them, taking away their historical agency, which is a form of systemic violence that is maybe on par or worse than the colonial violence of guns and bombs and threats and these sorts of economic extraction of resources and things like that. Assad does a really nice job saying, hold up, not so fast. Like if we're going to talk about this sort of thing in terms of resistance, what we are, first of all, who gets to be read as resistance by the historians, right? Because there are some people and some movements that in response to imposition from outside, they are read as and labeled resistance. And that is applause. That's approval. And then there's other people who are read as and labeled reactionaries, right? And that's the tisk tisk tisk. no, no. And so there is a process by which historians here are approving of certain reactions and disapproving of others. So if you have a reaction that is actually indigenously from the Sharia, that is trying to bring back the supremacy of the Sharia over governance or the supremacy of the Sharia over the violence of the state or the sovereignty of the state, then we're going to say that those are reactionaries. Right? Those are the bad guys. These are the people who are stuck in the past. These are the people who uh, they want to go back to riding camels and horses and all these sorts of tropes that come up. Right, But if there are a cultural elite that have been educated in the West and intoxicated with the ways of the West and seek to impose the ways of the West on their own nations, but they have the right skin color and they're not European and they're from this place, then we get to champion them as resistors freedom fighters. They're the uh, the paragons of enlightenment. They brought their Prometheus bringing down the fire, right? All these sorts of things. So Esad takes issue with this game that historians play. He said, let's be honest here. It's not simply that these people were expressing resistance. They themselves were part of this restructuring and they saw it as an opportunity to grab power and to put themselves in a certain position of authority when everything was getting reconfigured from the old society to the new society. This was nothing short of a power grab. And he says that imperialism in general, he says that we're not necessarily talking about motives. And he does a, a good job showing how, you know, the historical try to, you know, histor historians try to ascertain the motives of certain historical actors. And that's really dodgy business. It's not really possible to do with any sort of certainty. And so he says that imperialism rather is a totality of forces, right? As opposed to necessarily a strategic agent rather than ask, was this resistance or was this not resistance? These legal reforms that were initiated by the Egyptian elite themselves ask rather more important questions, which law is being deemed as in need of reform and which law is seen as sufficient and not in need of reform. Which law is considered primitive? Which law is being read as or labeled traditional? Which law is being read as and labeled modern? And he brings an example here in the Western tradition, something that shows the kind of hypocrisy or let's say the double standards that are at play here, because you have a tradition in England and also we inherited it in the United States of common law, which is something that goes way back before the modern state and way back before modern rational law and the ideas about law should be. And yet nobody for a second, even back to Weber, nobody for a second questions the status of common law as something that belongs in the modern era. Yet, when we come to something like Sharia, when we come to something that exists in other places, this is not granted validity. This is not granted the ability to enter into the space of the modern. This is not granted legitimacy. This is backwards and it's ossified and it's stagnant and it is in need of reform and change. Just a second. See if I, could you bring me a bottle of water? Is there a bottle of water? Thank you. <clears throat> I'm I'm always just a just as a kind of uh, uh, footnote. I'm I'm always uh, impressed how some people critique Islamic systems or ways of governance and rulership, saying, "Oh, that goes back to the seventh century and so on." It's so it's so old and so antiquated. I'm thinking these people are usually really keen devotees of what they call democracy. And of course, democracy was a system invented two and a half thousand years ago in a city <clears throat> called Athens in ancient Greece. It's far older than the Islamic system in that sense. And yet the arguments are, you know, the antiquity of 
uh, of a system don't seem to worry those people about democracy, which is an infinitely older system. I know it's been undergone yes. some changes, but it, it seems to be very selective when it comes to criticizing a system for being old. <laughs> democracy is probably the oldest current system around, and, it, and most people in the West don't have a problem with that. No, that's a fantastic point. Yeah. So it's not about how old a system is or how new a system is. Rather, that this is just language that we use to legitimize a certain type of violence, a certain mm -hmm. type of reform, a certain type of displacement, right? Anybody who wants to displace one system with another needs to come up with the language and the justification for why that should be done, right? And one of the most common resorted to languages that people have latched onto is the idea of uh, ossified tradition versus modern, old fashioned and antiquated versus new and groundbreaking and innovative. And in fact, that's also another perfect segment to, you know, Esad breaks down the language with which these reforms were being justified within the Egyptian scene. So we talked about, you know, the association of the Sharia with taqlid, right? This idea that it's just aping, right? Imitation and ossification and this whole even orientalist theory about the the gates of ijtihad were closed and you know uh, the fall right of of scholarly output and creativity that with everything in this particular era everything had ossified and everything was sort of these are the these are the dark ages right supposedly of islamic scholarship something that uh halak has pushed back against in in other books of his right this is not merely and you can't simply uh swallow the pill here whole and assume that this is merely a descriptive account, okay? Because the context here is within the context of colonial domination and reform. Mm -hmm. Rather than being a descriptive account, this is what we would call a performative account. This is actually trying to shape the way that people understand what's going on. To actually, it's a, we, in more layman's terms, we would call it a psyop, right? It's people <laughs> trying to associate the Sharia with backwardness, with ossification, with uh, static you know, uh, staticness and not dynamism and associate with the new reforms, all this, oh, it's dynamic and it's new and it's flexible and it's all these sorts of things, right? Um, so this is the interesting sort of dance that's being done where um, imitating the West <laughs> is seen as tajdeed, is seen as renewal and ibda, which is uh, innovation in a positive sense, right? And drawing on your tradition um, and the indigenous mechanisms for flexibility and change and development within that tradition are being read as taqlid and simple. Although, although I think that that's that's true. I, I think that there is an element of complexity here, which is often overlooked. I don't know if it's overlooked by <clears throat> Assad really, but that mm. even within the West, uh, there are forces that seek to um, drag us. Uh, there are elite pressure groups that, that drag the rest of us in the West in a certain direction. I don't mean to go on and on about wokeism and all, all that kind of ideology, but millions of people in the West are not happy with this ideology. You know, ordinary people in Italy, France, Britain, all over the place, let alone in Eastern Europe, uh, they're part of the West, and yet they are, they are being cajoled and, and you know, encouraged to, to imitate this progressive, modern uh, way of seeing things. But they don't want to go along with it because they see it as absurd, ridiculous, based on illusions and silliness, basically. Um, so it's not like the West is homogenous and mm -hmm. colonizing and telling the Muslim world they ought to follow what we in the West. Many, I, I would argue, perhaps most people in the West actually don't like it either. Mm -hmm. But because of the way the system here is contrived with the media and the mm -hmm. states and pressure groups, uh, we're all being basically forced uh, ideologically to follow it too but by car carrots and sticks and the carrots obviously the approval and you know you could be a good person the stick is you know um, cancellation deplatforming uh, mm -hmm. prosecutions and so on so i think in the west it's much more complicated than simply the west versus the rest the west itself is engaged in this uh, dialectic of of, of uh, action and reaction within um, as we speak, we see this in America with the cultural wars, uh, we see it in, in Europe to a lesser extent, perhaps. Certainly. And yes, the, I mean, much of um, anti-colonial and post-colonial scholarship, they have a nice way of capturing this reality that said that in order to colonize abroad, you must first colonize at home. Mm -hmm. Right. And that refers to kind of the, um, the whittling down and the homogenization of the different cultural and intellectual currents within the West. Because mm -hmm. when the West goes abroad, it does not present itself with all that full diversity. 
it no. presents itself as that sort of monolith, right? That sort of totalizing force because, because it's not, you know, those counter currents that exist at home domestically are not the ones that have the control of the state violence, right? And so mm -hmm. they're not the ones that are going abroad to, to colonize the other. It's really this one particular um, rivulet, right, of the stream that has sort of the dominated the state seized it for its own machinations and then goes abroad and colonizes and tries to reshape and reform and do all this sort of all this sort of work all right so there's a way in which colonization takes place at home first um and then it it presents itself and it goes abroad although i agree with you i, I think uh, again I, i'd like to offer a slightly different reading uh, for example uh we saw it's a very mixed blessing to put it mildly uh, just two days ago the new italian prime minister a lady who represents what the west the British media and the American media are portraying as a far right politician who's now mm. the head of government. But a lot of her platform is very anti woke, is very staunchly mm. family values. It's, you know, standing up for traditional values, Italian values, plus laced with an awful lot of really quite nasty Islamophobia and prejudice and everything else. But but there is pushback against the the, the um, if I can call it an American um, the American cultural hegemony that is pushing down on the Italians, and we see a resistance in, in Poland and and Hungary and let alone in Russia. Of course, I won't go there. But even with Trumpism in in America, um, the Republican base there. So I, I think that there there is a kind of low key civil war going on within the West. Actually, even put it that way, which is far from over. I, yes. I, I would submit that. Convulsions are, are erupting all the time. Uh, people are pushing back against certain agendas. I don't want to be too explicit here because mm -hmm. one doesn't want to be too, be too platformed as well. But I don't think it's quite all settled. The dust hasn't settled quite yet. On it may happen though, but, it, but at the moment it's not happening. But I agree with you that the, when America goes uh, into the into the rest of the world, it does present this face as being speaking with one voice. You know, the, mm -hmm. the LGBT flag goes up in. Kuwait, you know, Kuwait, the Kuwait right. embassy or Qatar embassy or the Saudi embassy, Rainbow uh, bombs. embassy in Saudi Arabia, would you believe it? Yeah, um, so there you get this clear homogenous voice that apparently mm. speaks for everyone in the West, but it's not really true. Mm. Many, many people in the West don't like it. Yes. And I would certainly agree that it's not over. I don't mean to say that, you know, by the colonization, you know, even the colonization of non, you know, uh, of non-European spaces is not over, right? It's still an ongoing struggle. And these are things that both are being, uh, they're being fought at the level of state and law and also at the, the level of ideas and culture and these sorts of things. So yeah, it's far from over, but there is a general thrust that, that one particular sort of stream of tradition or thought has the reins of yeah, the state yeah. violence Absolutely. and and it's interesting to think about the the potential responses because what we don't necessarily want and this is probably uh out of bounds for this for this particular video but we don't necessarily want simply another stream of the complexity to then grab the reins of the state and use it in the same way right mm -hmm. because then we're simply just going to have a different type of the same reality we have now right mm -hmm. and that's i think shown by particular politicians who are yes family values but also um very vi virally uh, sort of anti-islam and anti-muslim yeah. animus right trump being an example of that sure, and, yeah. and in PM, who is far right, but she's very anti-Muslim. Right. So if we're we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, when when yeah, yeah. if the game is if the game is simply trying to seize the levers of the state and then use that to actualize our own agenda, then there's several permutations in which that could be be very very bad, right? And so there's an interesting and a lot more thought, I think, especially from Muslims, has to go into how to get beyond that. Right, how to kind of uh, do some sort of it's also related to that issue that we talked about as simply imagining that Sharia law is getting the right laws mm -hmm. versus the right conception of law and the right conception of the relationships between law and ethics and yeah. populace and all these sorts of things. Yeah. Right now, we're stuck within the same relations we're stuck within the same conception of law and it's merely about the content of the laws yeah. right so somebody grabs the reins of the state and they make the laws to suit the woke mob and then the other group grabs the levers of the state and they use the levers of the state to assert their project right yeah. we want to 
try to, while recognizing that the content of those laws does affect people's lives in a very significant way, the relationship and the conception of law and the relationship between subjects and law and religion and ethics and all these sorts of things also in very, very real ways affects how we live our lives. And that is the domain that we need to think about how to reform that and how to influence that and shift that which I think we'll get to, uh, inshallah, by the end of this. So that actually takes us actually marvelously to the, the second sort of prong of Assad's two-pronged sort of exploration of secularization. The first was about um, the importation of foreign law, and that was a very real thing, and how it's not, it's not simple enough to just say, well, this was resistance, or to label it as resistance from the Egyptian elite, because in reality, this was a power grab. The nation state, the secular nation state, was an act of consolidating power and accumulating power in a way that wasn't possible under the previous regime and the previous form of governance. And so at this historical juncture, when the European colonizers were coming in, reforming the law, reforming education, reforming the economy, reforming the market, reforming all these sorts of things, there were particularly and they were particular ambitious individuals that positioned themselves in such a way as to benefit from the accumulation and consolidation of this authority and power. And they justified it in terms of reform and reforming the Sharia and reforming Islamic law and all these sorts of things. But in reality, what it did was it gave them a type of control and power that nobody had ever seen before in these geographic locations. Uh, just uh, 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 again, a little footnote. Uh, it's interesting to note that in the first half of the 19th century in France, most people in France did not speak French. Now, this may sound like a preposterous idea, but it's actually actually true because most people lived in their own regions. They spoke dialects like Occitan in the region I, I, I live in, and they didn't speak French. So, but the state itself, as the 19th century progressed, imposed through education and through law yes. a, a unitary education system and French, the French language, became the official language of the whole of France. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually the language of most people mm. uh, until, uh, the, the, until the 19th century. It's extraordinary to think that France wasn't actually French in terms of it. But this is an example of internal Western homogenization, yeah. state control, unitary, yeah. top-down uh, imposition of, of policies and education uh, that, that typify uh, European nation states, but exported, as you say, to Egypt and other countries with similar kind of dynamics going on. Yeah, the language issue is actually a quite brilliant issue as something that I think most Europeans can intuitively grasp. I mean, my, my ancestors come from Italy and mm. Italy didn't exist <laughs> until we have a saying that there are no Italians outside uh, except outside of Italy, right? Well, because it was in the 19th century, was it, that Italy became yes a country not in the 19th century yeah 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 exactly and uh and so you know there was no such thing as the italian language there was you know uh the what there's an argument even today as to what's a dialect and what's an independent language and this various sort of patchwork uh agreement of who gets recognition and who doesn't get recognition and who gets to have signage on the streets and in government buildings and who doesn't get to have signage and who gets to, get, to be taught right but even even up until you know the the second world war there was not you know italian Italian as, as a language was not widespread, um, probably not the native language of most people in geographic Italy, right? But the idea of the nation state and then the consolidization and the centralization that took place, you know, with especially helped by technology such as social media now, TV back then, right, was a big sort of, and the university system was a big sort of a, a huge uh, step in the process towards homogenization and these sorts of things. Yeah. The second prong that Esad wants to draw our attention to is the changes in the conception of law itself, right? So this is different than simply the content of laws, the conception of what law is. Um, and so his argument is that the shifting conception of law created space for the secularizing impulse, right? The limitation of the application of the Sharia, the curtailment mm -hmm. of uh, the place of faith and religiosity uh, with, within sort of quote unquote public life. And all of this was part of the project of how liberal governance 
could be secured. Uh, what were the moves in order for liberal governance to be secured in Egypt and elsewhere? One was the separation of law and ethics, mm -hmm. the conceptual separation of law and ethics. This, in this scheme, the individual now governs the self when it comes to ethics. Previously, the system of governance was not just responsible for holding people accountable in a criminal law sort of way for breaking the law, but also for breaches in ethics. They were one thing. The Sharia was one thing, law and ethics combined, which is why Halak actually takes exception uh, to the translation of Sharia as Islamic law, because it's more than law. It's actually a unity of law and ethics. What happens or what's achieved by the uh, by the separation of law and ethics is the privatization of religion, right? Because before, when there's that unity, when the Sharia is sovereign and we have the unity of law and ethics, this is something that it's all mixed together. It's a very social sort of thing, right? Um, Your not coming to the masjid to pray is an ethical transgression, right? Or you're not sort of um, adhering to certain muru'a uh, or certain sort of normative standards of Islamic morality and ethics is something that might take away, for example, your your status as a witness in a court of law. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a nice uh, a nice example. So when we separate law from ethics, we say that the law is only now concerned with, or let's the government is only concerned with the law, They're only concerned with um, violation of property, violation of rights, violation of, of, of safety, these sorts of things, then we push ethics into a private sphere and we basically say to the individual, you're on your own, right? You're responsible to figure it out. You're going to govern yourself. Um, the second sort of part of this is a new kind of subjectivity, right? Mm -hmm. So creating this sense that the individual is going to govern themselves. We have to ask what type of individual is that? Because that type of individual or that type of subject didn't exist <laughs> in the previous arrangement of things where law and ethics were considered a unity. It was not based off the idea of a sovereign subject that's going to police themselves. Yes, in some, in some instances, yes, in the Sharia, but in the sense that's meant by ethics is completely outside of the purview of law and government. The government has no say to make you develop morally. The government has no responsibility to turn you into a moral actor, right? This is something that assumes a certain new type of subjectivity that is thoroughly secular and modern and didn't exist before. One that is dedicated to ethical autonomy, right? I have to rule by my my conscience, right? This is like Kant, right? My conscience is is what it is. Exactly. And this is this is Kantian ethics, the idea of the autonomous individual who uh, rejects uh, heteronomy, the idea that there's an external source of authority that we must uh, submit to. Of course, Islam, obviously, sovereignty belongs to God, uh, mm -hmm. not to the individual. And it's also the, the the, the anti-collective, anti-social almost conception of the human uh, as an individual. Uh, and this leads, of course, to modern alienation, fragmentation, atomization, loss of meaning and social cohesion or, uh, and breakdown of the family. And we see the wreckage of that throughout the West. And that's now exporting as well throughout the world. Yes. And, and so as it also points out, not just ethical autonomy, but aesthetic self-invention. And this is something that's so uh, yeah. uh, hard to imagine in our, if you think about fashion, right? Mm. Think that fashion has only been around for maybe 100, 150 years in the sense that we understand it, right? The idea that I express myself or I invent myself aesthetically, mm. Uh, think mm -hmm. back to when you know we were in high school. You have uh, the goths over here and the punks over here and the preps and all these sorts of different sort of things. People expressing their individuality, expressing their autonomous selves aesthetically, right? As opposed to a pre-modern configuration, right? Where actually there was something to be said for uniformity, not in the way that we experience it today, but it was mm -hmm. actually a sign of social belonging and a sign mm -hmm. of sort of the thickness of social life that mm -hmm. people would dress similarly. You go to Saudi Arabia and you have the white thobes and the black abayas, right? Traditionally, like the, the men wear white thobes and the women wear black abayas. And up until very recently, that was like a, almost like an unspoken expectation and a, and a uniform, 
right? It made sense of society. It puts you, it made you easily readable. It puts you in a certain social situation that was not considered limiting or oppressive or anything like this. It was actually just part of your life, right? There was no sense that you had to express yourself as an individual, right? Through your clothing and the sort of aesthetics that you adopt for yourself. So this is an entire new subject. This is what makes it possible to have debates about whether the hijab should be uh, obligatory or not, or, you know, like, is it chosen? Did someone choose to wear the hijab or not? Or is this some sort of thing that's being imposed? These are new questions. These are new questions that are only relevant to a new type of subject that sees within their autonomous self, the right and the duty to invent them themselves aesthetically, as opposed to conform, conform to some sort of ideal, whether it's a social ideal or a religious ideal. And Essa pushes back on the idea that there is more freedom in this arrangement, because that's what people who are um, in support of this rearranging of things and this restructuring of things would say, well, well, now we've got more freedom. Before, you had to wear the black abaya, you had to wear the white thobe and the red checkered uh, shimag, and now you get to dress however you want. Look, this is increase, increase in freedom. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't help noting, I'm sorry to interrupt like this, but when I was in Berlin a, a month or two ago, the first time I've ever been to Berlin, I spent a, a week there. And it's interesting uh, uh, seeing how Berlin, ge how German youth dress. And, and it is quite different from how they dress in Paris uh, or in London. And they mostly dress in, in very drab blacks dark greys, very kind of uh, uncolorful attire. Now, these are very individualistic uh, Germans who are, you know, not in any way following fashion or convention or, the, or, or some kind of social pressure. But the vast majority of them actually look very similar. And they, as I say, dressed in these very dark colors, dark trousers, black shirt, black um, T-shirts and so on. I thought, why are, why are German youth all dressed like this? You know, um, because they're free. They're free, of course, in free Germany. So how are they like? And yet, there's clearly a level of social conformity going on mm -hmm. in an expression of, of an identity, a youthful identity, yes. which they're all following in the same way. <laughs> so I thought it was rather funny. It's well, quite different lovely. in Paris. You, you get much more colourful, and Italy. I need to say about Italy, uh, where you get much more individual expression that really is. It seems actually noticeable in germany everyone virtually everyone seemed to conform to this very dark drab gray dress code i just thought it's was, it was extraordinary no that's a very nice point too because it highlights the point that Assad then makes he says that this isn't about more freedom or less freedom what it's about is actually a different pattern of constraint yeah. Okay. It's a different pattern of constraint that we're used to so if we imagine a pre-modern past in which taking off your hijab is unthinkable, right? People would talk about you and you'd be pressured into wearing it. And maybe if we're going to use some sort of language, quote unquote, forced by some sort of social guilt or pressure or anything like that, okay? And this is a horrifying to the modern self, the autonomous self. This is a, a violation of rights. This is absolutely inconscionable. This is one of the worst things that could possibly happen, right? Um, we don't, we didn't simply remove that restraint. Okay. All we did was shift it around, similar to how Essa talked about violence before. Violence is still here. Maybe even it's more here in the modern era, but it's shifted. The targets of violence, who's considered a legitimate target of violence, has shifted. Okay. The, the type of constraint has shifted. Now, what's the constraint? It has to do with corporations. It has to do with fashion. It has to do with other sorts of things, like you're talking about the, the Berlin youth, when uh, the expression of sort of identities and other aesthetic values, whether we are, you know, disgruntled with the world and melancholy or whether we're you know uh we we're acting like we're in a coca-cola commercial and we're just you know living on cloud nine right yeah it's a different pattern of constraint yeah. i just want to add, add the, on that one final point about the berlin experience and i've mm -hmm. been told this by some german friends of mine who live there who are muslims uh that muslim men and women who are immigrants or come from immigrant families they have to dress like everyone else the 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 non-immigrant families so you won't see unlike you do here in london you won't see distinctive pakistani dress or ethnic dress or muslim mm -hmm. dress you won't uh it's, it's frowned upon uh it's absolutely not encouraged by the german state at all you're expected to quote unquote integrate um which simply means you've got to dress like everyone else and so you don't get distinctive looking muslim i mean for example the way you're, you're addressed where you are presented now would be frowned on 
Mm. You, you, hang on, you're not German. You're not looking like the rest of us. You need to be free. You need to be free to dress like absolutely everyone else does. And we all dress the same way. Right. And I'm not making this up. So you won't, you won't see Muslim looking people in Germany. Mm -hmm. If you do, they're under some watch list or they're frowned upon. Right. This is in the name of freedom, by the way. I can't stress the irony and paradox of this. Yes. But it's all there. And, and I, I, in Britain, in London, you can actually dress distinctively most of the mm -hmm. time, Muslims, I mean. You know, w women can wear the hijab. It's not frowned upon in England, although mm -hmm. it is obviously in France and Germany. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, no, that, that's a lovely illustration. It is about a different pattern of constraint. It's not exactly. simply more exactly. freedom or less freedom. No, it's just a different pattern of constraint. Now, Esa turns and he, instead of looking at clothing, he looks at marriage and he looks at family. Um, and that's really an interesting terrain that he goes into. So, for example, with, with the ushering in of the secular modern nation state, um, it's not simply increased freedoms right? Like it's just simply the pattern of constraint has shifted. So he talks about, he mentions a couple things that are actually make us less free in the terms of marriage and family that people used to be able to do in the pre-modern configuration of uh, configuration of things. One of them, of course, being, of course, being polygamy, you know, or polygyny more specifically, right? Yeah. This is something that was um, not just practiced, but but very common and accepted, uh, even up until recently in in places like Saudi Arabia and other places in in the Gulf. Um, no, and right, no crime in uh, in most places, certainly in the West. It, even though you can now have gay marriage and all sorts of right. wonderful things you could possibly imagine, but polygamy or polygamy, polygamy meaning obviously a man marrying more than one wife. Polygamy mm -hmm. meaning a person marrying, you know. Uh, Per, more than one person in the opposite sex is completely a criminal offence everywhere yeah. in the mm -hmm. West, uh, in America, in Britain, everywhere. Right. So it's rather odd that that should be the one thing that's criminalized. Right. And, and another thing is minimum age. And that's obviously a touchy subject and we can get into that. But, um, you know, not necessarily advocating for the removal, but just pointing of not advocating for the removal of minimum age requirements, but pointing out the fact that this is something that is a new restraint that was indicated that was ushered in by the state. And and it yeah. didn't exist before. So it's incorrect to assume that secular modernity gave us more freedom uh, with family, more fe freedom with relationships, more freedom to express ourselves. No, it's simply that the pattern of constraint changed. In addition to that, you know, registration, documentation, right? Yeah. Uh, registering your marriage, registering your birth, registering, uh, registering your death, all these sorts of things, all very, very new um, distinctive to the modern secular nation state. Where is the freedom in that? It's simply a new pattern of constraint we could get into. And this is just off the top of my head now, uh, travel documents, passports, visas, oh, all these sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, it, in the Ottoman Empire, this vast uh, empire, there were the thousands and thousands of miles. You didn't need a passport to go from Egypt to Syria right. to uh, Turkey, what's now called Turkey or Morocco or whatever. You could just travel freely. But now that these are little statelets and every country has its own borders and you've got to have passports and you're lucky visas of course uh, you may not get a visa you may not be allowed to travel you're vetted by security agencies and everything is and this is a modern world much more uh, uh bureau bureaucratized and controlled by external agents i.e the state yes uh, so, yeah Yes, so it's simply, we could argue more or less freedom and different, and maybe there isn't one answer, but we can definitely at least agree, I think any reasonable person, that um, the patterns of constraint have simply shifted, that it's not an issue of, of more or less, not in a, a clear way. The other point that he makes, and this gets back to the idea of autonomy and individual autonomy, is that individual autonomy cannot be created without the state, right? Every single freedom that you supposedly have is a freedom that is must be recognized and adjudicated by and defined by the state right and so we have this kind of shift where law and ethics have been separated and now you're kind of on your own and you have supposedly this freedom to express yourself and freedom to kind of uh follow your own conscience and follow your heart and these sorts of things and yet your autonomy is defined by the state and you cannot have by definition a type of autonomy that challenges the state or is not recognized by the state. Um, so to turn to the family and briefly, because we, we've already gone probably over an hour, um, what type of family um, is amenable 
to the secular nation state. Esed is very interested in, cha- in, in tracing the changes in the conception of family across that pre-modern to modern divide or the pre-secular to secular divide. Um, he talks about, again, he talks about defining terms, usra and aila in Arabic and how these terms did not come to mean, fa- they, excuse me, they came to mean the family that we associate as in a parent and their children, but they did not mean these things originally before the introduction of secular of the secular nation state um the type of family that is encouraged and actually even in some ways dictated by the secular nation state is one that is nuclear as opposed to extended um it is monogamous as opposed to polygamous it is urban as opposed to rural um Interestingly, he says that it's based off of a doctrine of love and happiness. And everybody, you know, watching the video, they're going to be, oh my God, up in arms. You're saying that marriage should not <laughs> be about love and happiness. And that's not what we're saying. Love and happiness is always part of any happy marriage. However, the nation state has a definition of family and an encouraged form of family that relies upon a certain doctrine of love and happiness more exclusively than Mm -hmm. other understandings of family. And if you want to realize this, just talk to anybody who, again, comes from a a more traditional society, such as Saudi Arabia, not everybody, but many people in Saudi Arabia still have a a traditional sort of society intact. There, sometimes if you talk to somebody who's moved abroad or have went to study abroad as a couple after they were married, they will tell you the differences. I, I knew a couple, for example, that they were, in Saudi Arabia, and it's very common in Saudi Arabia for an entire extended family to own uh, a building with multiple apartments in it. And every sort of quote unquote nuclear family has their own apartment within that one building. Um, and so you're going from that where you have all these cousins and uncles and the grandparents and you know uh, perhaps co-wives, right? And these sorts of things. And then you go to study abroad with your husband or with your wife to the United States. And now it's just you two. It's just you two and your kids. And I've heard the reflections of people who were in that situation and they have some really interesting insights. They said that we had to communicate with each other more than we were used to communicating. We had to get to know each other more than we were used to knowing each other. We had to actually depend on each other in a way that we weren't used to depending on each other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, Esed, I think, uses the word paranoia or obsession or something like this. Um, The relationship or the fraughtness of that relationship between spouses in the nuclear, urban, modern family is something that Mm -hmm. um, is extremely sort of, uh, it's a high stakes situation. It's like, you have to find love. You have to find love because you can't find satisfaction in a marriage that's so intensely intimate (laughs) in, in this way. It's mm. not your your social needs or your emotional needs are not dispersed over an extended family yeah. or dispersed yeah. over various social spheres. They are focused, laser focused on this one person who's supposed to be, according to the Disney movies, you know, the the one person that you bumped into serendipitously and fell in love with, and then you know, uh, it just was bliss upon bliss upon bliss until you know heaven come, right? This is sort of the idea of love that undergirds the nuclear family within the secular modern nation state. Mm. Um, and okay, so what's the purpose? Someone could ask, well, why would the nation state care about uh, one family over another, or one type of family over another? And Essence says that, well, here within the, the modern secular sort of arrangement of things, the family is a unit of society and the family is primarily responsible for inculcating the ethics because now the state doesn't deal with ethics. Now the law doesn't deal with ethics. And so in the first instance, the family is responsible for ethics, and so the family needs to be managed by the state. The family needs to be a unit of analysis and a unit of intervention when it mm-hmm. comes to the state uh, mm-hmm. in order to produce sort of the things that it wants. Second is that this arrangement of family, according to Esed, is more amenable to things like military conscription. Mm-hmm. Right. So now we're going to take, okay, we have two income earners, the woman, and we saw this dramatic change in the United States when women went out of the house, you know, for the first time in mass and worked careers and the men were off to war during World War II. Right. This is the sort of arrangement that the secular modern nation state prefers so that it can have two interchangeable sort of heads of household. And then one can go work and the other one can go fight uh, and die for the nation state. And this is also where, you know, this organize a society so that it can be the object of surveillance and control, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm.
Okay, drawing to a couple final points. Um, so <clears throat> what we have here is we have two spheres, right? We have the, the sphere of the civic, which is governed by the nation state. And then we have the sphere of the individual, which is considered as being um, governed by the, uh, the, the individual conscience, but also family. Um, the location of the secular power is partly in the split between law and ethics or law and morality, right? And this is one of um, the most important things. It's not something that was intuitive to people when the European colonizers landed abroad. And there's this great quote uh, from James uh, Fitzjames Stephen. This is on page 240. It's footnote number 79. He's a... Um, one-time legal member of the Viceroy's Council, and he describes the principles that animate the task of the colonial government in India. And he mm -hmm. says as follows, the government which now exists in India has not been chosen by the people. It is not. And if it is to exist at all, it cannot look upon itself as being the representative of the general wishes and average way of thinking of the bulk of the population which it governs. It is the representative of a totally different order of ideas from those prevalent among the natives of India. To these ideas, which are those of educated Europeans and particularly of enlightened, excuse me, educated Englishmen, it attaches supreme importance. These are the ideas on which European civilization is founded. They include all the commonly accepted principles of European morality and politics, notice the separation, those, for instance, which condemn cruel acts like the burning of widows or the offering of human sacrifices in the name of religion or the infliction of disabilities, as, for instance, disability to marry on account of widowhood or change of religion and others of the same sort. Mm. So the law, while he said, and he goes on to say, the law, while not itself a moral system, is indispensable to the re replacement of an inferior morality by a superior one. Uh, that's okay. that Asad's making that comment, of course, not the... Uh, yeah. Yes, that's not the quote. That's Asad's comment on the quote. Um, so here's the, here's the game. So we have, first of all, the separation of law and morality. The law is coming to reform the, the previous law because it was deemed as barbaric and not civilized enough. And morality is reconstituted in a way that's acceptable to European tastes. The other move that's going on here that Asad points out is the reconfiguration of what exactly it are the categories of law itself, right? Because if you go into the Sharia, every single book of fiqh, for example, is broken up into a certain system of categorization, and it begins with tahara. It begins with purification. That's in a law book, right? In a legal manual, okay? Mm -hmm. And prayer, and fasting, and zakah, and etc. You have all of this unity this unity of ethics and law, but you also have a certain understanding of different types of law or different types of offenses. All of that is being replaced by the civil and criminal offenses where it, ethics are just considered as just, optional. Indeed, but to the Quran itself, of course, it does have some legal material in it, but it has, uh, it, it mentions a car as well and spirituality and prayer. It, it is a, a holistic integrated uh, uh dean is a way of life uh it's not separated out compartmentalized in the way that european uh thought has you know parceled out these different segments so it, islam itself and its very it is very origins has this holistic understanding i think yes and halak actually points out that the introduction of all of these books of law with obedience in worship is actually part of a discursive act that's supposed to act upon the body of the individual, right? Mm. The body of the individual is supposed to submit to the acts of worship so they develop the capacity to, in a virtuous way, develop virtue and submit to the legal aspect, wow. right? We have the unity of ethics and law is not just simply a pre-modern chaos or a lack of you know, refinement or a lack of being organized or all these sorts of things mixed and muddled as some of the colonial administr administrators said. It's actually very intentional because at the end of the day, it's about developing virtue and it's about developing the virtue to be able to adhere and obey and submit. And so to reduce and retranslate and reconceptualize the Sharia as simply rules, 
even if we understand ourselves as Muslims and maybe engaging in this sort of Islamic reform project, if we're to come up with another nation state somewhere on a new island that nobody ever discovered yet, and we think that we're going to make an Islamic governance just by making Islamic laws, we've got it all wrong. And we have forgotten exactly what the Sharia actually is. The Sharia is not simply a collection of laws. The Sharia is about the conditions, establishing conditions within the individual and within society where you can actually develop virtue and develop the uh, capacity to obey not just some sort of legal authority, but your creator. Um, so to put a close to it all, in the end, the modern state, the secular state, is not just particular types of laws, but a particular idea of what law is. It's a particular idea about what the subject of that law is. It's a particular conception of what ethics are and how those ethics should be adhered to at all. Uh, I'll end this with a quote from Esad on page 255. A secular state is not one characterized by religious indifference or rational ethics or political toleration. It is a complex arrangement of legal reasoning, moral practice, and political authority. This arrangement is not the simple outcome of the struggle of secular reason against the despotism of religious authority. We do not understand the arrangements I have tried to describe if we begin with the common assumption that the essence of secularism is the protection of civil freedoms from the tyranny of religious discourse, that religious discourse seeks always to end discussion and secularism to create the conditions for its flourishing. Quite the opposite, that the Sharia was the attempt to create the conditions for a different type of human flourishing. And that is why um, that's our way. And it's so, it's so sad in the West, this alternative way of flourishing and living is actually completely, it's illegal, there's no space for it at all. You simply cannot do it. Uh, you certainly can't do it in Britain. Or it, it would be seen as unthinkable, actually. And, and yet uh, in, a, in a different world, this would exist. So thank you very much indeed, uh, Imam Tom, uh, for that magisterial survey of the book. Uh, this one, of course, Formations of the Secular Christianity, Islam, Modernity by Professor Tala Assad, who is Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at, at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, obviously in America. And this book is published by Stanford University Press. It's worth getting a hold of a copy uh, if you don't already have one. And uh, just a reminder, if you didn't know that uh, Imam Tom has a fantastic YouTube channel uh, entitled Itika or Utika Masjid? Utica, uh, yes. Utica. Okay, I got that wrong. Uh, which I'll link to in the description below. Please uh, do subscribe. I don't normally recommend YouTube channels, but uh, on this occasion I do uh, always recommend this particular channel for excellent, uh, very frequent content as well. And I guess that is it for now, Tom. Thank you very, very much. much indeed until next time thank you thank you